we're moving on to Bob Eagleston, who many of you will be familiar with, I'm sure, from his excellent book, um, uh, Doing English, uh, which is a, is a somewhat of a, of a classic for students leaving their A-level literature courses and moving in to their study of English in higher education. And we're very lucky to have Bob with us today, um, who I know is going to be talking to us a little bit about some ideas about English and the knowledge curriculum. Um, Bob is a professor of English literature and works at Royal Holloway, University of London. Um, and it's been my pleasure to work with him on many occasions over the years. So Bob, thank you for joining us today. And um, over to you. So I'll begin with two apologies. Uh, firstly, um, I always try and be positive and up, but I'm afraid this uh, presentation is quite negative and attacky. So I apologize for that. Uh, and as it were, the second half will emerge in time, but not this morning. Um, and the second thing is it's quite kind of detailed E. It's part of a longer project, uh, as uh, Andrew and Dave know, about things that are, seem to me to be going wrong with English. And it's about, so when something goes wrong with your computer, with the software, there's often, there's a problem in the software that needs to be kind of debugged. Uh, and um, what I'm trying to do in this paper or, or this kind of project is think about these things deep in the software of ideas that are going on that seem to me to be kind of damaging. And um, the, the names for what are damaging uh, English are uh, E.D. Hirsch and Young and Powerful Knowledge. Now, I want to say uh, really quickly, this is not, I, I'm not, my argument isn't political. It's not about skills versus knowledge. It's not about progressive versus traditional. Instead, it's about something very, very esoteric. It's about the nature of hermeneutics in Hirsch, the nature of Hirsch's theory of interpretation. Uh, but in fact, although it seems very esoteric and just for academic journals, it's this, it's his, inter his, his interpretation of interpretation, his sense of how interpretation works, that is having the most damaging effect on the nature of teaching of English. So it's a bug deep, deep down in the software. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Because deep inside his software, Hirsch has tried to turn English into a science. And I'm going to explain why and how he did this and what the impact of that has been. But just as, as background, I want to say a couple of things, very broad things first. And if you go to the first slide, Andrew, that'd be really helpful. Um, basically, I, I think like Aristotle thinks that there are different forms of knowledge. So not that there are different, not just different knowledges about different things, but different forms of knowledge. And here are two kind of examples. I think actually everyone thinks this. Second example is about uh, acting. So knowing your lines, knowing how to speak your lines with somebody else, knowing how to perform, knowing how to act, being able to get on with the rest of the cast, knowing the history of the play you're acting in, these are all different kinds of knowledge, okay? Knowing how to kick a football and knowing the history of a football club are different kinds of knowledge, okay? And that's my, I'm not going to argue that, I'm saying that's my kind of background. Okay, if you want to go to the next slide, Andrew, that'd be really great. Okay, and one way of understanding these uh, different sorts of knowledge is understanding the difference between the arts and the sciences. But for Hirsch, he says quite early in the 60s, he says the much advertised cleavage between thinking in the sciences and thinking in the humanities doesn't exist. Okay, so I'll talk about E.D. Hirsch for a little bit. There are basically two Hirsches. There's an early Hirsch and a late Hirsch. Okay, and the early Hirsch is um, writing academic articles and uh, books about interpretation. And the late Hirsch is a kind of um, a guru uh, invented critical literacy. But what's crucial, okay, what's crucial is the fact that these two Hirsches are linked. And that's the esoteric bit of software in their thought that I'm going to be talking about and I hope to show at the end um, how it's impacted everyday teaching. So in the late 1950s Hirsch thought that English he said was a playground for the jousting of opinions, fancies and private preferences where the stake is not knowledge but the so-called higher humane values. So he didn't like that, he thought it was all chaotic, there was no order. 
And in an article called Objective Interpretation from 1960, he said he outlines a new theory of interpretation in which knowledge of a text's meaning can be established objectively like other forms of knowledge. And his academic books, uh, essentially validity and interpretation, follow this up. Can we do the next slide, please? I've got to learn how to do this, haven't I, in the new future? Okay, and this is how he um, turns the nature of literary interpretation into a science. First step, you choose a, a central principle, what he calls a determinate object of knowledge. And he says rather weirdly that anyone will do, but the one he's going to choose, because it seems the most obvious, is the, uh, what the author's intention was. And of course, in 1960, he's running against a whole um, generation of American critics who uh, believe in the intentional fallacy, that you don't, you don't work out what a poem means by going to ask the oracle. Rather, you, you, you work through the text. And he's going absolutely against that. OK, two, and this is the crucial step. OK, you make a distinction between what he calls meaning and what he calls significance. And this is the this is his core trick. OK, uh, and it's wrong, but let me explain it. He says that meaning is that which is represented by the text. It's what the author meant by his use of a particular sign sequence. It's what the signs represent. Significance is the relationship between that meaning and a person, conception or situation. So he means something like this, that a meteorologist, a commuter and a poet might all take a different significance from a cloud. One thinks it's a stratocumulus cloud, one thinks it's going to rain later today, and the other sees the cloud as representing loneliness. But its basic presence, its meaning for Hirsch, is there for all of them. And you can see how, in a simple way, this is true in the natural sciences. You know, there's an object, and the object might mean different things to us. I mean, to me, to you, it's just a borrow, but to me, it's a very important uh, thing I feel very strongly about. Uh, as, um, but this distinction between meaning and significance probably isn't true for interpreting literal poetry. I'll talk a bit more about that. And then step three, you introduce what he calls validation. Is the meaning right, accurate? Now he wanted to call this process verification, but decided it was too definitive sounding for a process that's based on weighing probabilities. Validation is what turns understanding into knowledge. And without it, interpretation cannot lay claim to intellectual respectability, he says, i.e. it's not a science. The aim of validation is to reach an objective conclusion about what an author intended a text to mean. Doing this creates, correctly creates knowledge. So you create a determinate object, okay? You say that it has a meaning and then you validate, you prove that meaning. What proves meaning? What makes validity? In validity and interpretation, her suggests an advocacy system in the image of the legal system. A ruthless critical process, he says, in which critics bring evidence and argue for interpretation, and one of their number acts as a judge to adjudicate which meaning is finally and permanently correct. Hirsch writes that while some uncritical or fractious souls might stubbornly refuse to assent to conclusions so reached, this does not exclude such conclusions from the domain of genuine knowledge. Uh, somebody writing on Hirsch writes that um, while some scholars and teachers may welcome this legal system for determining what's valid in a in a meaning for its promise to return to rigid authority and discipline Hearst offers no specifics how will judges be chosen how appeals might work what might prevent an intellectual tyranny and suggests that Hirsch's theory is in many respects bluntly authoritarian okay so an expansion of a roughly scientific idea of knowledge the literary Hirsch has run counter to the general agreement about how hermeneutics interpretation works in the humanities and literature altogether. And his slightly ludicrous call for a final judge reveals how misapplied these ideas are to the humanities and to literary studies, as if there could be a fixed interpretation decided by a literary judge and we'd all have to agree with that. But what's interesting is, uh, Andrew, if we have the next slide, it'd be really great, uh, is what Hirsch has smuggled in to his ideas. OK, uh, he smuggled in first the idea that knowledge 
is a set of statements about something. That knowledge is kind of like individual atomized facts. Okay, all sorts of aspects of literary work have been gathered together as atomized facts as a kind of thing. And you might say to yourself, is our view of the relationships between characters and novels a kind of atomized fact? Second, that these atomized facts can be judged right or wrong. Uh, that they're kind of quiz facts, you know, did, uh, and thirdly, um, that he's created a division between uh, novices who don't know those right facts and experts who do know those right facts. Um, and roughly, this is, this is a kind of, uh, a kind of positivism. So positivism is that kind of philosophical doctrine that says if you can't say it in a proposition that can be judged true or false, you just shouldn't bother saying it. It's just not, it's not worthwhile. And, and that, I think, you can see how that's already rubbing up against the tradition of our tradition in English. Um, okay. And then it's gone to what he's opposed. If we go on to the next slide, not only has he smuggled some things into the software, okay, he shut some things out. He shut out the idea that knowledge is, arises, that is a kind of experience or a habit of mind or a knowing your way about. I mean, sorry, don't get me wrong, science is obviously great, but it's different from this, these kind of knowledge. It's, he's against um, the idea of hermeneutic circularity, that one part of a thing, it, can only be seen in the context of the whole, but the whole is also illuminated by the part. Weirdly, he's against our being in time. Okay, he wants to say that literary meaning is true the way an equation in physics is true. It's kind of true for all time, because it's based on what the author said then at that particular time. Uh, and because it's a, a scientistic kind of approach, he's against the idea of participation. He's for, so science works by objectifying something and we have a kind of view from nowhere, which offers us a kind of truth, okay? Whereas the humanities, because the subject is us ourselves, we are automatically participants in it. Okay, so, uh, and then if we go to the next slide, please, Andrew. Okay, sorry, no, before we get to the next slide. Um, so the later Hirsch, basically repeats this same process. He finds uh, everything in disarray and disorganized, okay? And he needs to assert a kind of order over it using this uh, natural, uh, this positivistic interpretation that arises out of the natural sciences, okay? And so he kind of invents cultural literacy, finds a world in disarray and seeks to hold it together. And he talks very clearly about cultural literacy being a, a national religion and so on. And I, I'm not, worried about that or talking about that at the moment but rather okay the idea that um in order for cultural literary literacy to work you need to have kind of atomized individual fact factets quiz facts for people to know like people learn scientific equations okay you can't create the whole um you can't understand webs of things or relationships between things in this factoidy kind of way Okay, interpreting, interpreting literary text is not only about taking on information, a poem's not an instruction leaflet. Central to literature is precisely the going backwards and forwards, the wandering and the sudden moments of recognition of understanding. As an audience, you come to understand that Hamlet is a certain kind of person. As a reader, you come to understand Elizabeth Bennet's motivations. Okay, and I can tell the same kind of story with Michael Young's idea of powerful knowledge. Again, it's, it's a Deep in the software is this idea that it's a science and this is being rolled out to things, other forms of knowledge that are not scientific. Okay. And let me talk about the three consequences. Andrew, if you go to the next slide. Okay, so the first one, somebody mentioned uh, messianic edu gurus in, uh, in the chat already. So one thing that, that the deep software of Hirsch has enabled is all sorts of, um, shallow thinkers and uh, hucksters kind of making these claims out of half understood uh, popular science. Uh, and obviously that the, the Hirsch's secret science software and popular science go together really, really well. And in fact, Willingham and Hirsch uh, work really closely together. I mean, they were as people. 
okay uh, and so that's that's one thing so there's lots of shallow thinking second sorry this is my first point as well um hirsch's work has made the teaching of literature fertile ground for both good and bad aspects of cognitive studies cognitive science it's right that how students learn is informed by working cognitive studies of course uh, but, but it's not right that what students learn is shaped by this if it were um the trouble is that what you learn is shaped by how you learn the content is shaped by the form and indeed that's one of the key lessons isn't it of english it's not just what the poem says it's how it says it the issue then is getting the balance between the how and the what cor correct but what for example dan willingham's funny and influential and well-written book suggests is that students learn these atomized right or wrong facts this is not the dialogic discursive nature of the discipline okay and i, I want to say that um and i'll be saying in, in the other half of this kind of project at length is that other forms of cognitive science are available okay there's not just willingham and hirsch that work so well together there's also people like michael gardner uh, the, the discipline mind quite as famous and influential and important as dan willingham okay it doesn't write quite as amusingly but but th there are all sorts of different ways of understanding it and as soon as people people start quoting um things out of popular science it, it's always kind of they're always choosing it in a very partial kind of way and finally i want to talk about three impacts of teacher on teaching um i was horrified to hear about scripts in english okay um so one example concerns direct instruction highly formalized and explicit teacher-led drill in english this is obviously enabled by this kind of scientific idea of knowledge goes hand in hand with cognitive science this isn't teaching the habits of mind that response literature needs and even willingham actually is ambivalent on drilling particularly for english um but to another uh, another example of this is this uh, ongoing and i think renewed concerns over literary terms the knowledge curriculum suggests we should teach more of these terms as if they were scientific and then utilize them when we spot an appropriate specimen of hyperbation or whatever it might happen to be but in contrast for example isabel woodger an ocr subject advisor in english wrote in her blog last november that english subject technology can hinder rather than help not only of course can terms be misapplied but she says the real danger that in doing the work of remembering the term the candidates can forget the meat of the task interpretation spotting terms and interpreting are not the same thing as the examiner's report in 2008 put it subject terminology is useful in helping candidates understand how texts work but can sometimes leave them feeling they've done enough when they've identified a feature rather than using such identification as a springboard for explaining the impact and yet you can see how the natural science idea of teaching english is very pro adding up all these terms and being like a botanist and saying this is this and this is this and this is this but that's really should be a secondary thing which enables the understanding rather than the thing that you're looking at first okay yeah hend ideals i've got no idea what those are there's some sort of okay and the third thing i want to talk about uh quite shortly is about curricular reform so i've seen some uh curricula um which, which seem to be uh very confused about what english is and come directly out of this uh natural sciences uh powerful knowledge secret ed hirsch software studying english as a science one curri curriculum for example doesn't appear to be very interested in literature at all but with history so history is another example where um things can be boiled down to key facts that could be right or wrong okay what year was this play who was on the throne then for example the key knowledge um in this curriculum the key knowledge for oliver twist um is not like how does novels work or anything but life in victorian london and victorian crime that's the key knowledge not the form of the novel or how he relates the characters and nowhere in the curriculum map for this curriculum for the novel over year seven eight and nine is there a discussion of character plot narration narrative voice how a novel works or even what a novel is 
I mean, you just study a novel to understand and enjoy how novels work, okay? Not to find out a bit about Victorian fiction. Not, uh, not to find out about Victorian crime, okay? But an essay on Victorian crime can be full of right or wrong little atomic facts that can be judged correct or incorrect. But this curriculum is limited in other ways as well. For example, in its consideration of poetry, it seems only interested in metaphor. And again, metaphor spotting, very straightforward, quasi-scientific technique. Uh, of course, metaphors are important, but what about poetic voice, meaning, form? Again, looking for easy to prove uh, atomic facts. And to my mind, the worst thing about this uh, student curriculum and about uh, Dave talked about scripting earlier on, is something uh, utterly at the core of our discipline, I think, is, is student response. In English, student response is both knowledge itself and the starting point for all these other kinds of knowledge. For example, if you find yourself liking a character, that's great, that's a response. But the next step, the literary critical step, is to ask yourself what aspects of the text have made you like that character. If a poem makes you cry, the next step after drying your eyes to think about the textual details of how this poem achieved this. And the curriculum doesn't allow students to take their knowledge of the text from one text to another, doesn't pay attention to personal response. Okay, so that's, so those are three kind of examples done very, very shorthand. And I see there are lots of uh, much more complicated issues around it that come directly from this scientific software deep, deep in their thinking, okay, to the impact in the classroom the overuse of literary terms, the curriculum, which is so keen on positivistic facts, it's not even about literature anymore, uh, and the idea of, of drill that you could like learn things, okay, are all direct, come directly from, the, from this deep scientific software in their thought. So I want to say that um, English needs to introduce students to what literature is, not to history or to science or to learning kind of facts. And there are basic ideas and core concepts in literature, the basic generic forms and ideas about fiction, knowing about features like narrative voice, how plots work, narrative arc, structure, closure, a sense of how form and style work. We all know these things. We all know them often incohately. We had a lot about tacit knowledge already this morning. So the sense that we, um, that we know all these kind of things, but we can't necessarily articulate them. Okay, it's by encountering and mastering this, this, this kind of tacit knowledge, by having this experience, not some watered down version of history or context, that students will learn to read and love literature. Okay, so um, I slightly lost track of time, but I'm going to finish there. I'm really sorry, there are lots of questions, I do understand that, and it's a very, a very uh, cut down piece, I apologise. Thank you very much. I've kind of finished, Andrew. Thanks very much indeed, Bob. I'm going to unmute Andrew. Was I going to? I was going to take the questions, Andrew. But having unmuted you, there's a comment there from you. I wondered if you wanted to make that first. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I mean, um, a, a couple of things. One, I was thinking as you were talking there, Bob. Of I don't know if you know it, but there's an excellent poem by by Billy Collins called "Introduction to Poetry." No, I don't know it. I, I, I will read it for everybody. Um, this is a. The, uh, introduction to poetry. I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a colour slide or press an ear against its hive. I say drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem waving at the author's name on the shore but all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with a rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't help thinking about that as you were talking and how appropriate that seemed. But, but my question was, this, uh, I wonder if this cuts to the heart of, a, of an experience that a lot of, uh, a lot of teachers might have had and a lot of students might have, which is that, that you know, when we're teachers of English and people who love the study of literature and so on, we, we present the idea that you can interpret, that you're free to create meaning, um, as the great virtue of the subject, whereas that might be exactly the thing that's the most threatening to a lot of people who are trying to learn English. And it seems to me that's a tricky square to circle. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. And, and it seems to me that Hirsch um, and all of his, uh, his ideas about, about knowledge might be quite relevant to that dilemma. 
Yeah, uh, that, that's a very big question. And um, I kind of feel that uh, I can't quite access the file in my mind. I do have a really good answer to that, but I can't quite access it. So I'm going to blather for a bit first. Um, so, so, I mean, Hirsch is trying to answer that. Hirsch thinks, I mean, Hirsch thinks there is a right answer. Okay, and that's what Michael Young thinks as well in the end, actually, and powerful knowledge thinks there is a right answer, as is a right answer in physics and, and maths. But I suppose what I want to say is that, um, well, let me, answer it, let me answer it like this, which is that in, in maths, the right answer is the one that everyone converges on, that, that, that the answer is four or 78 or something, okay, or X is 12. But in English, we recognize both like at the AOs and when we read criticism in ourselves, that the, 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 we're looking for divergence, yeah? So the, so the, the, the best criticism is, di is full of divergent voices. And we know when we read something that a student writes or that an academic writes or anybody writes, when it somehow um, is their own voice and lets them say their own kind of thing and is different from something else. The AOs talk about original interpretations and so on. Okay, we recognize that as being really impressive criticism because we recognize criticism as being a kind of doing and not a, not a sort of repeating learning product. We recognize it as something which is, which is enabling our kind of inner, our inner voice or, or something like that. Okay, so and we we and we see we know when it's well done. It's quite hard to pin down when it's well done, but it, it we have an incohate sense and sometimes a more cohate sense of what makes a really impressive answer. And so the the the, the, the question is really about um, how do we how do we get to that? So the thing about the assessment objectives is if, if you think about them as being what kind of questions do we want students to ask of literary texts? How do those assessment objectives stimulate those kinds of questions? And then what kind of answers do we, do we like, do we approve of? So one of the things that people always talk about their English teachers is how they model being, uh, being interested in things. So um, who is the lovely man who's head of all the head teachers? Jeff Barton. I saw him give a wonderful talk about English teacher who inspired him you know who played some jazz records and did this and did that and, and it's a kind of what we're teaching are, is kind of habits of mind that arise out of experience we're not teaching we're not teaching if you like so much straightforward facts we're teaching ways of understanding facts and similarly when um when science teachers teach experiments I mean I know there's lots of work in uh, philosophy of education about why teaching experiments is a bad teaching technique but when science teachers teach experiments they're teaching a habit of mind a way of thinking about things so we're teaching a way of thinking about things which will generate not a right or wrong answer but a kind of rewarding full coherency kind of answer and so that's I mean and, and if we see that as being threatening then yes it is I mean, I, I don't see, I mean, people, um, when students do maths and find that very difficult, people don't say, don't find it difficult, maths is easy. They say, learning quadratic equations is quite hard, but we're gonna take you through how to do it and teach you the habit of mind that resolves it. And that's true also for English. Does that answer your question a bit? I'm sorry, that's quite so. ranty. Thanks, no, Bob. no, that's fine, thank you, Bob. I think that answers it a lot. I'm going to just, I'm going to take one question and ask for a, for a brief response to it, if you could. There's one that's come in the chat from Ruth that says, what are your views on the Oak National Academy, backed by the DfE, that has launched during this period of remote teaching and learning? Does it facilitate a national view of knowledge, which is likely to be Hirsch's ideas? Uh, so that's a really good question, Ruth. And uh, so when the Oak Academy started, I thought to myself, I'm going to check this out because it makes me feel anxious. Okay. And, um, but I haven't had a chance to check it out, but I, but I can tell you what makes me feel anxious about um, online learning and not just my inability to share a PowerPoint on Zoom, for which I totally apologize. I did try and learn how to do it yesterday, but you can only do it when you're actually live. Um, so my profound view is that uh, although of course there are kind of science style facts you can learn in English 
these are the dates of Charles Dickens, our subject is a profoundly dialogic one, which involves people talking to each other, uh, teachers and students and students to each other, and any kind of um, broadcast which you can't talk back and have a dialogue, okay, seems to me to be a real loss to our subject. And I see this profound thing in all sorts of ways. So lots of my academic colleagues are very cross that historians are always on TV and the radio, but it's easy for historians because they're just telling you a straightforward kind of story like this. But in, but in English, where it's about a dialogue and discussion and thinking things around, oh, is it like this? No, what about thinking like that? How does it change? Okay, and that's really, really hard to do in a broadcast, uh, non-dialogical kind of way. And so one of the things we have to be learning is how to use like we're doing today with a group chat, how to use the di the potentials for dialogue in online learning in a much more effective kind of way, I guess. Um, but but I, I'm quite worried about the Oak National Academy because anything that's, that's saying, um, you know, now I'm just telling you about this is, ki is kind of killing it. Because part of, in our discipline, part of what it is, is the experience, the dialogue, the thinking through, the changing your mind, the wondering what other people think. And, and that's an absolutely crucial part of it, not just in a kind of fluffy hippie kind of way, but also in terms of the, 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 the core skills for employment that we teach. Okay, so the core skills for employment that we teach involve listening, responding, dialogue. And that's why English academics do very well in business because they're able, they've had those skills enhanced by their subject. So not only are we, are we losing the kind of lovely dialogic core, ethical core of our subject, we're also losing something really important, the skills that this subject teaches. So um, I do worry about the Oak National Academy. I will look into it more. And I'm certain it's absolutely backed by Hirsch's ideas. Uh, and and I, everybody on this, in this conversation knows that knowing the date that Charles Dickens died tells you nothing at all about Oliver Twist. Does that make sense?